First, I'd like to welcome you to our Business Builder Speaker Series. This was an idea born out of the COVID days. When COVID first started and we couldn't get together in person, we said, let's get together uh, once a month virtually. We'll bring in a speaker on a topic that we think is of value to real estate agents. Uh, we know you're busy. We appreciate you giving us your time. To make the most of your time, we encourage you to ask questions and participate utilizing the chat box. Uh, join us next month. Our Business Builder Speaker Series is the third Wednesday every month at 1 p.m. And next month, I'll be speaking, doing a quick overview of 2024 GAR contract changes. That'll be Wednesday, February 21st from 1 to 2 p.m. on Zoom. It isn't uh, for CE credit, but it is good information. Uh, this month, I'm pleased to introduce Deborah Bettelotti from Maximum One Executive Realtors. She is the Associate Broker and Compliance Broker. Uh, Deborah has been speaking on uh, Realtor ROI, on the value proposition that real, uh, by, uh, real estate agents bring. And at this point, I'd like to thank Deborah for being our guest this month. And Deborah, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Doug. I'm pleased to be here. What a privilege. I appreciate you having me. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go right into what we all want to talk about, which is the Realtor ROI value proposition. We know things have changed this year. We know that more than ever this year, we are going to have to show and demonstrate our value. I hope you can all see my screen. Can you see my screen? I do. Awesome. Well, today, like I said, we're going to be talking about our value proposition. With that, let's go ahead and very quickly, I was introduced already, but you heard about what I am with a compliance broker and all that. But more importantly, this is who I am. I am a grandmother. <laughs> grandmother of nine, actually, here are well, six right now are in this photo, one in the belly and two more in Miami. So with that being said, that's my proudest, most proud accomplishment right there. And you can imagine how crazy our life is when we have all of them at our house. If you haven't heard about what's going on in the real estate market, then you've been sitting under a rock, right? What do you think I'm referring to? Obviously, the lawsuits. We're not going to be talking about lawsuits a lot because I am not an attorney or in any way really uh, have the authority to speak on it. But we are going to briefly talk about the buzz that's out there, right? Which is that what? Things are changing. And with that, we know that there is only one constant in real estate. And that is, of course change. We have gotten to the point where we believe real estate is done in a certain way. We have used words that we shouldn't have used. We have used comments that we haven't used, that we shouldn't be using. And so what I want to refer to today is what really, really needs to be looked at, concentrated on, and that is our value. I want to begin by letting you know that there are 18 states that require written buyer representation agreements. Of all our states in the United States, there are only 18 that require it, which Doug could definitely elaborate on that at any other given time, that we in Georgia have been ahead of the game. We have been able to really be proactive versus reactive regarding these lawsuits. And with that, we have been able to stay pretty much out of the spotlight. However, some of the spotlight that has been made about these lawsuits have to do with buyers' commissions, as well as comments, even comments made on social media. In Kansas, for example, there were over 10,000 social media posts that were taken out from realtors in private groups, mind you, that had stated, or real estate agents and realtors, I don't know exactly what percentage were realtors and what percentage were real estate agents, but they made comments such as, I'm not showing that house, or I can't believe they're only offering X amount. 
But here's the reality. Of the 18 states, let's see which ones have the law or the written requirement. And I'm going to go ahead and on the West Coast, that's what we have. Then we have Minnesota and Nebraska, Wisconsin, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and of course, here in Georgia. Those are the only states that require the buyer representation agreement to be signed in writing. Now, the fact that it's not required does not mean you should not have one. Because the reality is that agents are hesitant to get those signed. And I really want to implore the importance of you not being hesitant. You have to understand why. Why are you hesitant to get these signed? I'm sure Doug's not going to represent us without something being signed. And the reality is that there is a perception that a value and price, right? There's a perception that if, let me start with the perception. There's a perception that if we ask a buyer to sign an agreement, they're going to walk away. But the reality is if we can demonstrate the value, that is going to overstep the price. We will pay more if we know that it's worth it, right? Are you going to prefer to get a steak? I'm a vegan, but for those of you that eat meat, would you prefer to get a steak at, say, the Waffle House or at, say, uh, Ruth, Chris, Chris, uh, Ruth Christie's? right? You are going to prefer to get that better steak. And I would venture to say, even as a vegan, you would probably go to Ruth Christie's. <laughs> so with that, you want to be able to have the same idea when it comes to the real estate services. I mean, how do you find a doctor? Do you just go and Google doctor nearest me? I venture to say that you probably don't. You are probably looking at their reviews, right? You're probably saying, hmm, is this doctor really good? Did he just get licensed yesterday? Am I going to let this doctor operate on me? Am I going to let, let this doctor make a decision about my medical condition when I know nothing about him? Am I going to let a lawyer, an attorney, make a decision on representing me in a legal situation with not really understanding if he's just been out of law school yesterday or if he's been, if there's been any complaints at, with the bar. You're going to be looking that up. You're going to be researching it. But because of the own behavior that we as real estate agents have done, we have created a sense of, we are really not much more than salespeople. And I say it that way because to me, I have enough value and I love what I do enough to know that I'm not just a salesperson. The house is going to sell itself. I'm an educator. I'm a guide. I'm a tour guide. I'm a trusted advisor. I am... And I want to be their counselor. I want to be their, you know, I want to be there for the buyer and the seller every step of the way. So we become so much more than just a salesperson. And if we look at our business as just sales, we are not giving it the value that we need to give it. So even in a vacation, let's think of a vacation if uh, Doug and his wife are choosing to go to the islands somewhere for, to get out of this wintry cold, right? You are probably going to want to make sure that the hotel doesn't have bugs, doesn't have reviews that uh, there's leaks in the roof or anything like that. You're going to be looking for that best priced, but yet best value. 
that you want for that vacation. Coach, let's look at the coach purse. Same idea. I'm constantly seeing people that would rather buy a black purse that says coach on it versus that $2 coach. I mean, a $2 uh, purse that has no name on it. They will choose to go to a coach for status, for uh, the look, for the quality, right? And they don't mind paying more because of what the what they are going to be receiving. I mean, let's think about those Stanley Cups. Have you heard about of those Stanley Cups? It's all over the news. Yeti and Stanley uh, show down there. So the reality is, will it really keep my drink cold longer? I don't know. But everybody talks about how much value you get in that Stanley. So let's look at the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a psychological theory that was proposed by Abraham Maslow in 1943. I love that. It was a paper that he did called A Theory of Human Motivation. And it's often depicted as a pyramid, right? And it's consisting of five levels of human needs, our basic needs. So if we look at that, you have the physiological needs, which what could that be? A home, right? We have the home. We have our safety needs. We want to feel safe. That all relates. This is all in relation to our real estate needs. If we understand the buyer's needs, if we understand even the seller's needs as to their motivation for selling, looking at this Maslow's hierarchy, you may be able to kind of analyze it better in your minds. So you have the, the physiological needs, which is going to be the home, the house, the safety needs, which is obviously possibly the schools or near work, things like that but we are human. And even though we are in a technological society today, we still need that human touch. We need to lo love, we need to feel the love, we need to feel the belonging, and we need to be able to feel that sense of connection. And then we have esteem, right? Why do people buy where they buy? Do they wanna be in a community, a swim and tennis, near golf courses, in a golf course community, et cetera? And then self-actualization, which is esteem, respect. We once had a client that wanted to buy a house and he found this house and he goes, I love it, but I can't buy it. And we said, why? And he said, because the house next to us, next to this one is way too nice. In his mind, uh, he was a professional athlete. He didn't want his neighbor's house to be better than his. He felt his house needed to be the best house in, on the block. So understanding Maslow's hierarchy will help you understand the needs of your buyer. And if you transfer this to real estate, it may help you in understanding how to find those needs. Additionally, you need to demonstrate your value. That is what we're talking about today. What is your value? Why should I hire you? And why are you any different of a real estate agent than the one next to you? There are over 1.5 million realtors in the US right now. And in Georgia alone, I believe we have 40,000. So, Hey, if we all have access to the MLS, we all have a license to write a contract. What makes you the one I should hire? That is the word. That is the, the fact of what you need to think about today. What sets you apart? Think about that. Let's list these. Because if you think about 30 years ago, when I first got licensed, to today, we didn't have all the technology we had 30 years ago. Even clothes, cars, even baby food. I remember driving 30 to 40 minutes away to get a natural baby food that I wanted. 
And now you have like 20 or 30 different kinds of baby food in the store. You have so many choices. And I think these choices have actually made us indecisive. It is so difficult to make a choice these days, right? Whereas 30 years ago, it was this or that. Now we have this, 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 that, this, this. We can't make decisions. So we need to set ourselves apart. And if you look at it, people will splurge, right? We talked about those vacations. We talked about that coach, even that Stanley versus Yeti cup, right? People will splurge when it comes to something that makes them feel that it has superior benefits. It has to make you feel like you have superior benefits. That is the key in order to get hired. You have to have a value proposition because if two agents tell the buyer, number one, I can get your home on the MLS, or number two, I even have a team of people that work with me, or number three, I have great negotiation skills. Why should I choose one over the other? We need to have that value pro proposition. Okay, Deb, you're telling me I need a value proposition. What does that even mean? Let's talk about that. You have to be a solution finder. Remember, I told you, I don't want to be called a salesperson. Car salesmen sell cars, right? They have a product, it sells. We are connecting with people. We are a solution finder not a salesperson. Finding a home or selling a home is not what I do. If you tell somebody, I'm going to be the one that finds or, or sells your home, you're doing nothing different. But if you demonstrate your value and set yourself up as that solution finder, you find out what their needs are and you find the solution to those needs you watch, you're going to see a difference in your business. I mean, more than the house needs, right? You know, Maya Angelou, I'm sure we've all heard of Maya Angelou. She had a famous quote, or she has a famous quote. I'm sure you guys are already thinking it. People will not remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. So take that. I love that quote of Maya Angelou's because if you remember that you have to make somebody feel right because people want to do business with who? With people they like and people they trust. And if they just like you, but they don't trust you, you're not gonna get their business. If they trust you, but they really don't like you, you're not going to get the business. So you have to understand what that value proposition is in order to be able to make them feel and know that you are the one for them. So let's find their needs. And again, not just their house needs. What is the motivation? Why do they want to move there? I want to be close to my grandchildren. I can definitely understand that. I want to be close to work so I don't get home so late. What is the reason? Because when you are at that point where you're negotiating and you're able to say, oh, Doug, I get it. I know that you're concerned about purchasing this home. I know you're concerned about the price. but guess what? We can get you that much closer to work so you can be home for dinner with your wife. That is going to make him understand why a decision has to be made. And I'm talking a lot about different things that are going to go into your USP or your unique sales proposition, your value proposition. And that requires you to have your tagline. What makes you different? What sets you apart? Why me? 
right? And then your client services, your features, your benefits. Why am I going to look at your services any differently? You all have access to the MLS. You all have access to possibly a team. Think outside the box. This year, you have to work. You have to think outside the box. If you stay within those boxes, start looking for another career. I don't sugarcoat things. Those of you that have seen me, no, I don't sugarcoat. You have to be creative this year. Think about your client services outside the box. You can even be funny. I had a, cl I had a student in one of my classes that talked about how she used to be a professional comedian. So I said, great, talk about being a professional advisor, professional counselor, professional whatever. Think about it and be funny if that's who you are. Be serious if that's who you are. But be aware of being creative in talking about your features and benefits. And then you have to have social proof because you can tell me you're fabulous. You can tell me you have great features, but if you're not showing me and telling me that others have already experienced your value, then I'm not going to believe you. And then I won't trust you or like you and you won't make me feel good. So in doing that, I want you to kind of think, well, what about if the issue is I just started? How am I going to have social proof? Unless you are just turning 18, you even then you might even have some experience, but you have experience somewhere in business. Use that business. Show me how professional you were in the other business. Get people to write a letter, write a testimonial about how wonderful you were in your previous career. And if it was, for instance, as a server, you might say, wow, she had some amazing customer skills. She really followed through from beginning to end. You're not lying. You're giving me social proof. I didn't say she was great at the beginning to end of selling a house, but customer service falls into real estate. So use every bit of your background in order to create that value proposition. So use those three elements in order to create that compelling proposition. And that will show that you are worth getting paid what you are worth. With that, every one of your value propositions should have your mission, your vision, and your values. And if you don't know your mission, your vision, and your values, start there because it needs to demonstrate that. If I say, Doug, what do you stand for? I bet you he can tell me. I bet you he can tell me what his mission is. I bet you he can tell me what his vision is. And I bet you I, he can tell me what his core values are. That is what professionals do. They understand those things. And your value summary is going to basically be what you do for your client and how you do it. So what do you do for your client and how do you do it? And the how is basically related to your skills. How you put it into words, well, that's between you and chat GPT. But <laughs> that is something that you can create with chat GPT easily and even though ChatGPT is controversial for some, it still requires you to put your values in there. Know your target audience. You have to know who you are speaking to. For instance, if you are targeting a young buyer, first time home buyer, and who may be a trust fund baby, for example, you're probably not going to go to LinkedIn, right? Where are you going to go? TikTok, Instagram, social media, right? Whereas if you're targeting a more experienced buyer, investor, you might go to LinkedIn. 
but understand where you're going to target those buyers. And then when you're wording your value proposition, keep that in mind. Because if you are speaking to a 20-year-old, you're probably going to word it a little differently than if you were speaking to somebody a little bit older. So the same with, are you targeting the VA crowd? You're probably going to speak to them more about their service, more about what can be done. What is different about a VA buyer? They have no down payment, right? So you will possibly speak to that in your value proposition, understanding that you have the knowledge to work with the military or the armed services. The main point is know who you're targeting. Additionally, how do I get the buyer to sign the agreement? That's the question of the year, right? It's really the question of the decade. But Deb, I just can't get them. It's a culture thing. These are all things I've been told. It's a culture thing. It's an age thing. It's a relationship thing. No. Guess what, guys? Again, like I said at the very beginning, if I go to Doug and say, I need you to represent me in a transaction or I need you to represent me in an uh, attorney relationship, but I don't want to sign anything because my culture doesn't sign anything, I can pretty much guarantee you he's not going to represent me. And if I said, but Doug, you know, I just want to try you out first. He probably will say, great, go try somebody else out. Come back when you're serious. You're not going to, don't think of yourself as anything below another profession. But here's the thing, guys. It's the law. It's the Georgia law. So it might not be the law in another state that you might operate in as well, but we're going to talk about that. But in Georgia, it's simply easy because it's the law. It says that it must be in writing. So explain that to the buyer. Explain it's an official document. Explain what it means to them. It's going to protect them as well. Because you cannot offer representation without first having it in writing. But other agents do it. Do you want to work with an agent that follows the law? Or do you want to work with an agent that simply is playing with the law? Or in a situation where you're not in a state where the, the law uh, states that, do you want to work with an agent that can put it in writing and has enough value to really provide you with that representation in writing? Or do you want to work with somebody that may or may not stay with you? I always present it as it's my commitment to you as much as it's a commitment from you to me. It's our mutual commitment. It's my promise that I am going to do for you what you want me to do, which is provide you with the best possible service. But let's look at a very effective way. If you're a real tour, not a real estate agent, it wouldn't fly the same way, but we'll talk about that. If you're a real tour, Article 9 of the NAR Code of Ethics. A buyer agent can refer to the article and state that I abide by this code. Let's look at it. For the protection of all parties, it shall assure whenever possible that all agreements related to real estate transactions, including, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it talks about the fact that we must have it in writing. We must represent our client in the best possible interest. We have to look out for their best possible interest. So right there, Article 9, even if the state does not require it, but you are a member of the National Association of Realtors, then you have this that you can print out, provide it to them, read it together. Let them read it and understand that that is another reason why you need that agreement signed. You can also look at standards of practice one through 13. I didn't have that one on the slide, but that one also says that if you are working, um, with a buyer, with a client, it says when entering into a buyer agreement to advise potential clients of five things, you have to advise them about company policy regarding cooperation, amount of compensation, 
um, potential offsetting compensation, dual agency, and confidentiality. You can just look up the code of ethics and look at standard of practice one through 13. That will explain that somebody that signs a buyer representation agreement has more benefits than somebody that does not. Think client versus customer. So if they don't sign it, they are your customer. You don't have the ability to represent them. And that falls under code of ethics, not just the ability to say that it's the law. Additionally, you can use analogies. Analogies work great. We talked about the coach purse, the Stanley uh, water cup. You can do the same thing. And you can advise them like we talked about if you go to an attorney, if you go to a doctor, hey, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith, I want you to operate on my knee, but I don't want to sign anything. You think they're going to operate? Why do we treat our business any different? Heck, you go to the gym, they make you sign a liability waiver. And yet we have hesitance to have a buyer sign an agreement that is going to benefit them. Mainly, in my opinion, and this is just my humble opinion, I feel that agents don't get it signed because they themselves don't understand the value that that agreement has. So as much as you want to give yourself your own value and show your demonstrate your value, you also want to demonstrate the value of that agreement. Now, you can always use the mirror like, like explain to them in an analogy that if you've ever sold a home, you knew you had to sign something, right? If you got a job, have you ever had a job? Well, yeah. Did you have to sign some paperwork? Well, yeah. Well, you're hiring me. Why would you think that we're not going to have an employment agreement? They are hiring you. That buyer representation agreement is your employment agreement. Think of it that way. Use that analogy. Why would you hire me without an employment agreement? And again, people or agents seem to think this is strictly, oh, they're not going to want to do it because they have to pay me. Well, guess what? They're hiring you. Yes, they have to pay you. But the reality is you're also telling them what they are paying for. You don't mind paying if you know what you're paying for. But if I just say, hey, Chris, give me a uh, hundred bucks. I just need a hundred bucks. That's not that simple. But if I say, Chris, I really need a hundred bucks so I can go buy that really, really wonderful shirt that you want for you. <laughs> You're, but yes, yeah, so you want to have a purpose. Give them the reason why you are doing it. Um, just like other agreements, explain to them like we talked, the lawyer, the doctor, the gym. Make it real simple, the gym. You go buy a cake at a grocery store, you have to sign something, right? You have to sign in order for it to be an official document. Do you want an official document or do you want it simply to be a, hey, you know, whoever buys or sells my house? No, you want a professional. That's why I don't like non-exclusive agreements. A lot of times buyers or sellers that sign a non-exclusive agreement have the idea that they have to stick to that one person. But the reality is you're throwing it out to the world. So you're not getting one single agent. You are throwing it out there and it's not benefiting either of you. You're not getting that full service or benefit. The me principle is another way I like to look at it. Put them in the driver's seat. Any of us that have been married or are married or have had a friend, relative, daughter, child, anything, know that when we're talking to somebody, if it if you tell them the sky is blue, my husband might say, no, it's not. It's gray. It's gray. But then he walks out. I let him mull it over. He'll come back. He goes, do you know the sky is blue? If it comes from them, 
it always works out better, right? Make them have that idea. Make it the me principle. What is best for me? We are in a very entitled society. We want what's best for me, right? So if we can understand why is it in my best interest to sign this agreement, things will change. You see, signing this agreement will officially get the ball rolling to get you closer to work. You see, signing this agreement will be in your best interest because you'll be close to your kids. You see, signing this agreement today will get the ball rolling so that you get that lower interest rate, not today, but you see what I'm saying. You are putting it, connecting it to their emotional motivation. That would be the me principle. And that's no official or psychological Maslow hierarchy, but it's just what I like to call it. Put it on, put them in the driver's seat, basically. And then, of course, you have the pro quo principle. Principle, And again, we have to think of where we live, what how society is today, right? We want something. We want, we'll give you something if you give me something back, right? The pro quo. I'll give you that if you give me that. So we could possibly, and this is just an example, we could say, if, when you sign the agreement, if you sign it right now, I'll waive my retainer fee. If you sign the agreement, I'll add a home warranty. Home warranties are free for most for, in listings for uh, most companies, by the way. So you could easily use that as a benefit. Go ahead and sign right now and I'll throw in a listing agreement, a listing uh, home warranty. You see what I'm saying. You come up with whatever. It, I had somebody that used to be a stager, a professional stager. If you sign right now, I'll give you a professional staging. Whatever you want to say. But just think of the pro quo. Get to know who your audience is and understand how best to serve them. And then solid reasoning. If you have a very analytical person, you might want to just make sure that they are able to reason. So if you sign this agreement, it shows a mutual commitment. It goes back to what I like to say. It's my promise to you to do what I tell you I'm going to do. It's what's going to keep you uh, or me accountable with what I'm promising. That would be solid reasoning. Signing this agreement shows a mutual commitment, allows me to fully represent you to the best of my ability. You do want my 30 years experience, right? Because if you don't sign it, all I can do is open the door. So again, solid reasoning, logic. Make sure if you have an analytical person, you go there. Understanding it's an official document. In the states where it's a law, it's the law. So just know who your audience is. And then the compensation. What do you want to work for? If you were going out there and looking for a normal job and they said, hey, Tracy, you know, I'll hire you, but I know you want X amount. You know, I know you want 30 bucks an hour, but I'm willing to pay you five bucks an hour. Are you willing to work for that? You know, I know you really like me and I really make you feel good. No, Tracy probably would say, uh, no, I'm going to work for what I want to believe my values worth. I see agents negotiating their commission down all the time. There is no standard. There is no level field. You can charge whatever you want. Sellers can pay what they want. Buyers can pay what they want. But the reality is what are you as a professional agent willing to work for? That's what you have to decide. So when somebody asks me, you know, are you willing to negotiate your commission? Sure, we can go up and offer more to somebody else. You know, I'll, I'll throw in an extra bonus to them or no, 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 that's not what I meant. I meant down. Oh, well, no, I'm not willing to work for anything under this. What are you willing to work for? Because if you used an analogy, and again, be careful using this, depending on who your client is. But if I were to say, Sure, I can go down, but Chris, can you also give me 50% of next week's paycheck? 
you'd probably say, well, no, you have to remind them, this is my paycheck. This is what I'm willing to work for. Too often, they don't realize that this is our paycheck because they see it as, oh, you're getting this huge amount. So just understand what you are willing to work for and don't devalue yourself. Because if they say, but the other agent was willing to do this, yeah, there is no standard. They're willing, they can work for whatever. But if I'm so willing to renegotiate my own worth on my value and on what I'm willing to work for, how good do you think I'm going to be in negotiating the value of your home? Throw it back to them. <coughs> so as far as compensation sections in the Code of Ethics, you can always go to these articles. And these articles will talk about uh, cooperative compensation um, as well as uh, guidance for NAR members. If you don't belong to NAR, you could ignore these requirements. But I will tell you, if you're not part of NAR, you need to have a standard. What is so great about being a member of the Board of Realtors, of a National Association of Realtors, is that you have a standard that you follow. And when I say standard, I don't mean commission. I mean simply a standard of how we operate, values standard. So please be aware that with all the buzz out there, it doesn't mean oh, I'm going to get rid of being a realtor. No, it's not about that, guys. It's about how we operate and conduct ourselves in this business. Um, the part to, uh, Some of the current buzz in the real estate are these that we've removed in most MLSs, the cooperative compensation, which was the participation rule, which simply meant that we had to offer something to somebody else if it was in the MLS. Most MLSs have removed that. Um, as well as the roles that we have for sellers and listing brokers and the buyer and bro buyer broker roles in the uh, buyer broker compensation. If you've taken the 2024 GAR contract changes, you'd understand that some of the things have changed. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today, but definitely listen to next month's by, uh, Business Builder with Doug that'll talk about that, as well as his classes that he offers on it as and other classes out there. The buyer agent value to the buyer is uh, as well the current buzz as we are here talking about it. But the key in all this is you need to be transparent. A lot of times agents didn't want to talk about the buyer agency agreement because they felt, ooh, they're going to walk away when they know they might have to pay. Be transparent. And we've made it transparent in today's contracts because now in the contracts, it specifically discusses the buyer's role in compensation. But the participation rule, like I said, was already removed. The co-broker now offers, uh, the co-broke offer is now optional for the seller. Now we have it in the contracts that the seller directs. We have the full transparency. And like I just said in the previous slide, the buyer agent value is now required. So, just be aware of that. But do I really need an agent? You know, that's going to be a question this year. I believe, and this is just my own humble belief again, that some buyers may feel like they can go at it alone because they don't really understand the value of having an agent. They feel like, well, all they do is write the contract. So why don't I just go to the seller's agent and be unrepresented? So it is our duty this year to show the value. Now, the analogy is sometimes you've had bad experiences, right? So again, you're going to have to get past that. You're going to have to explain to them, how do we do that? I'm going to implore you this year that you do not show a buyer whatsoever, ever, without first having a buyer consult. You need to have a buyer consult. When you have that buyer consult, you will not only be finding out their needs, but you will be doing them a great 
favor by explaining who you are, what your value is, and showing them the benefits in using you as a buyer representative and get that buyer representation signed at that consult before you ever show a property. Some of the needs that you need in your value proposition are your bio, your resume, your unique value proposition, as well as your services and your skills. Like I said, always, always have a buyer consult and always do a great buyer presentation. Obviously, we don't have time to go into all that today, but talk to your broker, talk to your companies, ask about buyer presentations, and definitely keep your continual learning in order to understand that. I will show you very briefly what I mean by having a written and a proof in the pudding value proposition. For example, if you have a document that looks like this and you give this to your buyer, it's going to be impressive. You have your tagline at the top, helping clients home for over three decades. And again, I just threw this together, so don't judge it. And then showing your bio there, a brief bio. Again, chat GPT is awesome. And then your services or your benefits. I like to use the why me. Again, I, I reminded you outside the box. Don't be just benefits and list benefits. That gets boring, right? And then don't believe what I say. Look at what the social proof might look like. Put some testimonials there. You give this to a buyer, it's going to make them feel good. It's going to make them say, huh, he does have experience. He does have the knowledge. Explain all that. And then a resume. I just threw, put in their mind, but you can have a resume there. And when you have your resume, you know, people don't think of having a resume when it comes to real estate. And that has always boggled my mind because you should have a resume. Like I said, during the class or during the, the speaker speech today, we talked about you're being hired. If you're being hired and you go to a normal job, what do you have to provide them? A resume? It should be no different. Provide the client with a resume. Again, if you have just started or don't have the experience, you might have put customer service skills for over X amount of years, sales experience for over X amount of years, negotiation, advisor, whatever. Come up with what you are and come up with a good resume to provide them. You give all this to a client, they will be impressed. Again, the main key, the main topic this year is going to be value. You have to demonstrate your value. This year, you have to work. You can't sit back on your chair and just wait for the phone to ring. So that is all I have for you today. Are there any aha moments or any questions anybody might have? Okay, Chris, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Hi. So with the um, with the bio and the resume, those are definitely things that I want to put together. But is it good to put together kind of like a listing? package and a buyer's package so you have that ready to go with everything that you've already kind of explained so that when you do get that buyer or that listing person you can just kind of plug in the things that would apply to them is it good to have something like that in advance absolutely that's a great great idea now obviously these days you're not going to be printing much so it's oh. all going to be on the internet but for instance, if all of a sudden you're working with somebody that is over 55 and they're looking for an over 55 community, you might change it up. And that's the beauty of technology. Because yes, okay. you can have it ready, have your listing presentation or your listing package and your buyer package ready. And you can definitely mold it to whoever your target audience is. 
but great. So now you, you now you would kind of just put that as like a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um. Well, you can. Um. So it would be either a PowerPoint or there's uh, on your KB Core you have the ability to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So you basically publish it to the web. So you're basically sending them a published link. Okay. It does look like a PowerPoint, but it's more of a PDF that's published. Okay. Okay. Great question. Yeah, you've got my I, my mind running. With all <laughs> these, like, I'm like, I need to know this place. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome because that those agents that do exactly what you're doing right now, new or experienced, are the ones that are going to succeed in 2024 and beyond. Other than that, uh, Doug, I will turn it right back to you. There's my information in case anybody needs it. And I uh, love to uh, hear from y'all in the future. Thank you. Doug, I think you're muted. Thank you, Deborah. A couple of the things that you mentioned that really stood out to me. Our one is the concept of getting employed as a buyer's agent, uh, drawing the analogy that this is like obtaining any other position, that this is a you are a professional seeking employment and that you behave in the same manner as other professionals who seek employment. Uh, the other thing that I like that you did was drew the analogy uh, in the same way that uh, attorneys have representation agreements and other professions. Uh, one of the most important things when I take someone on as a client, my legal services statement tells them not only what do I do for them, but it tells them the things that I don't do. These are the services that are not part of the representation. This is not part of the service I'm providing. So these are the things that I, I do on your behalf these things are not included in the services I provide. So setting that scope. So those were a, a couple of what I thought were important takeaways. I love that. And you actually made me start thinking of some options with that as well. But And I didn't bring it up in, in today's uh, podcast, but setting expectations is, ex is basically what you stated. And you've got to set those expectations properly. And just like Doug stated, as far as putting what we don't do, you could also say that, get creative using those things. I don't just show you properties. I don't just do this. Obviously, be a little bit different in real estate. But yes, we have the habit of thinking of ourselves as inferior professionals. But we are working with people looking for an investment that could be potentially their most important financial investment in their whole entire lives. So we need to give it the importance that it has. And, uh, and go ahead and in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to thank Deborah again for being our guest today on the Business Builder Speaker Series. She is a wealth of information and I knew that she would be. We do record our Business Builder Speaker excuse me, Business Builder Speaker Series. Uh, we post them both on our YouTube channel and link to them on our website. Uh, give us a few days uh, for our video person because he'll uh, he'll clean it up, add the, uh, the theme music and the credits and so forth and make it look professional. One is that'll give you an opportunity if you ever want to revisit and, and pick up points. And the other is if you want to share it with others, uh, you'll have the ability to do that. So we'll have a, a link out here shortly with a copy of the presentation from today. So okay. thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from the great philosopher Kenny Rogers in his song, The Gambler. And that is, my hope is that you've got an ace that you can keep from our time today. So I uh, hope you got an ace that you can keep. Uh, best of luck to everyone in their uh, real estate careers. Uh, stay in touch with sh uh, closing attorney Shea Fritz and Dean and with Deborah Bettelotti at Maximum One if we can help you. Have a great day and we'll hope to uh, see you again at the closing table soon. <music>